Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. Due to advances in technology and bioscience, the most efficient ways emerging to treat pain and injury revolve around the nervous system. Using the human body's amazing ability called neuroplasticity, it is now possible to activate increased strength, pain-free movement, and faster healing. This is the Nubi device, a patented electrical stimulation device used for neuromuscular re-education. While conventional treatments for pain and injury only manage symptoms, the Nubi device allows you to work at the source of the problem. Using this approach, 90% of individuals notice meaningful progress in the very first session, and evidence is showing those early results also lead to faster overall recovery from most injuries and surgeries. There's finally help for people having difficulty recovering from injury, living with chronic pain, or experiencing challenging neurological conditions. Ask your doctor or therapist about the newbie from NewFit, accessing the power of the nervous system to improve outcomes. Hey everyone, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. Uh, thank you for joining me. This is going to be a really cool lecture. I'm really excited uh, to do this for you guys. So we're gonna be talking about what I do every day and that's developmental functional neurology. Um, specifically, what I wanna tell you about is the neurodevelopmental blueprint for brain development. Because it's so important, it's what really differentiates what we do from everyone else in healthcare. Uh, developmental functional neurology is a, a very new part of healthcare. Um, I'm one of three guys that you know got to teach this um, over the past few years. I was involved with this most recent uh, graduating class. So really excited about this. Now, there's a lot of information, okay? And I, I couldn't not leave out a lot of this information. I'm trying to give you as much information as I possibly can because I want you to be able to use this and apply it to your scenario. So I want you to be able to walk through the brainstem, uh, the cerebellum, the cortex, and understand how all of this comes together in order to make a functional human being, right? Because that's ultimately what we all need. Now, um, as we go through this, what I want you to do is not only think about how this information applies to you know, the person that you're, you're watching this for, um, but maybe yourself or you know, other loved ones in your family, your, your other kids, your aunts, your cousins, your whoever you know, may need this information because this is not just for brain injury, right? This information is, you know, it, it's, need, it's needed for brain injury recovery. It's needed for neurobehavioral disorders. It's needed for mental disorders. Um, all sorts of anything that has to do with abnormal brain function, this information is vital, okay? So let me switch over, let me share the screen here. And we'll get going. Okay. So like I said, we're gonna be talking about the neurodevelopmental blueprint for brain development, all right? So this is gonna be super cool. This is me. Um, like I said, my specialty, so my primary licensure is chiropractic. My specialty is uh, developmental functional neurology. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit more about that later, but so I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. We're just north of Austin. We're actually in Cedar Park, which is, um, you know, just outside of Austin. I'm co-founder of Shed Light, which if you got my, my other lecture in this conference, you know, that's the company that sells laser therapy and we're big on educating and, and that type of thing. Um, I'm a managing partner for Developing Minds. Uh, I'm a managing partner in a consulting company. I'm a part of SNA Biotech, which is a software company uh, dedicated for brain rehab. 
Um, I'm on that medical advisory board. I'm a part of brain chat lectures. I have other international endeavors. I love educating and uh, I own part of a CBD product line, um, the Stay Strong Johnny Grant CBD line. So that's me. I like to stay busy. It's fun. If you want to follow me on Instagram, there's my whatever you call it, handle. I don't know what you call that. The at B Crawford DCs, me on Instagram. And then on Facebook, it's just Brandon Crawford. Uh, feel free to follow me if you want to see, you know, the kind of crazy things I do. Uh, get a peek into the office every now and then. It's pretty cool. All right. Here's the disclaimers. All right. So I am the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds and Shed Light, like I already mentioned. Obviously, I have financial interest in both these companies and products or information sold by them. This information is for educational purposes only. Please use it only for that. This information is not intended to diagnose, treat, manage, cure any medical conditions. Please con consult with your medical provider before implementing any of this information. Okay, so we're going to talk about the neurodevelopmental blueprint for brain development. We're gonna spend several slides on this. Uh, I want you to really grasp this and be able to understand it. Um, this is trademarked as the Melillo method, uh, as you'll soon find out why. So functional neurology is a rapidly growing and powerful section of healthcare. Uh, within this great profession, we now have the specialty of developmental functional neurology. So you, we have functional neurology, which I you know, was obviously a part of, and then uh, even more specialized is developmental functional neurology. All right, the specialty is true functional neurology and is the only model of healthcare that makes sense to achieve full and complete neurological health and healing. And we'll talk about that and you'll understand what I'm saying. All right, developmental functional neurology has been pioneered by Dr. Robert Melillo, hence the Melillo method, right? Um, over the past three decades, Dr. Melillo has selflessly researched and clinically tested these methods and has proven this blueprint for brain development. Other methods simply do not produce these types of lasting results, okay? I've seen that clinically. Um, I've had several patients come in where, you know, they're doing things like primitive reflex work, which is fantastic. I love primitive reflex work of any type, really. Um, and, you know, they've been doing this for six months, a year, two years even, okay? And we achieve, in one week, we achieve better results than they've gotten in two years. And again, it's just about doing things at the right time with the right oscillation, you know, the right frequencies, uh, targeting the right networks at you know that moment in time and doing this in the proper order. So some basic principles of functional neurology, okay? We have fuel and we have activation, all right? We have to pay attention to both sides. So fuel is our oxygen and glucose, our blood sugar, right? Those are the two main things. There's other things like fatty acids, amino acids. You know, amino acids make up all of our neurotransmitters. Um, but what we're gonna do is we have to make sure that our neuraxis, our spinal cord in our brain is adequately fueled in order for us to then stimulate it to achieve the desired results, right? So if we have a breakdown in fuel, let's say we have a metabolic issue like, you know, blood sugar problem and anemia, thyroid problem, gut dysfunction, some kind of other organ dysfunction, an infection, inflammation, autoimmunity, okay? All of these things, can act like roadblocks to develop our brain, right? Because they're sitting there causing problems, inflammation and, and you know, lack of oxygen and all these things, okay? That whenever I go in there and start to activate these neurons in areas of the brain, I can't get the fullest potential or maybe that network will go dormant because it can't keep up with the stimulus, right? So a neuron is operating, right? It has to have adequate fuel. It has an input, right? A stimulus or something comes into it. It has to replicate proteins in order to fire and keep up with that stimulus, right? So if we have a fuel problem and it can't replicate protein enough, it'll either go dormant or it'll even die, right? So we have to pay attention to that fuel component, right? And that's why things like HBOT are so important, right? Doing HBOT, especially after an anoxic or hypoxic brain injury, because we need to establish proper fuel. We need oxygen, okay? Um, so the other part of this is activation. What I do every day is I activate the neuraxis. Again, the neuraxis is the spinal cord in the brain. I do this by stimulating various types of receptors. Okay, so in our, our skin and our muscles and our tendons and all these things, we have receptors like muscle spindles or Golgi tendon organs or other types of things that what they do is they receive information and they project it into our spinal cord and that goes up into our brain, okay? 
So we activate the Neuraxis, uh, and then we can specifically target whatever networks with different types of, you know, uh, stimuli. So that's what we do. So, so functional neurology is fuel and activation. Okay, that's in a nutshell. Okay, now we're going to go more into it. Okay. Now the basic principle for the uh, of developmental functional neurology is that there's an order of how all this needs to develop um, to get the best results here. So we have a bottom up development. And we have a horizontal right to left development. And then our brain matures and we get this what we call top down regulation. Okay. I'm going to go into all of this in much more detail, but this is just, you know, a very basic outline. We have bottom up, right? And that's talking about the brainstem from the medulla, pons, midbrain, bottom up, and then from right to left. And then we mature our brain, we get a top down regulation. Okay. Now you're going to understand this a lot more as we go into this. So there's a basic blueprint for all brain development. This blueprint must progress in the right stages at the right time. If this does not occur, the brain will almost never self-correct and properly develop. We must be able to go back to the point that the blueprint was not followed or altered. Okay. This identifies where there was a deviation from normal development. All right. Do you understand that? So what we need to do is just say in a brain injury circumstance, right? Um, we need to be able to go back and go, okay, where were they in development at the point of time that they were injured? Because that can have an effect on what systems and networks were really, uh, were more so damaged at that point in time, because some of them are going to be more metabolically active because they're growing, right? So it's very important to note these things. Once there's a deviation from normal development, the trajectory of normal development is altered. Okay, this alters the development of functional connectivity. Development and integration of networks will not be optimal and may be significantly disabled. Okay, so once there's deviation from normal development, okay, there's a trauma or something happens, okay, and now we have altered development. If we don't go back and correct that, the trajectory of that altered development will ultimately shape that brain right? It will ultimately shape who that person becomes in many, many, many different ways, okay? The most common reason for this to occur is a developmental asynchrony, all right? Obviously, we have thing, other things going on too, we'll talk about them, which is primarily epigenetic, epigenetic, right? This alters uh, bottom-up and top-down development, but is correctable at any age, but only with proper intervention from a developmental perspective, all right? So how do we apply this information to brain injuries? Well, what developmental stage was a person in at the time of brain injury? This will affect several things, okay? What networks have been most damaged, especially with the anoxic type injuries? And what I mean by that is this. Let's just say that, you know, you were developing your right hemisphere, specifically your right frontal lobe or your insular cortex um, at the time of a drowning per se, right? That means that when, when that, that kiddo drowned or that person drowned, these networks that were developing were actually more metabolically active and had a higher demand for oxygen and nutrients, right? Because that's how the brain develops, right? And so this area had a higher demand. And so whenever that person lost oxygen, this network can actually be more so affected than the networks that were not actively developing at the time. You see? So that's how we can have this widespread yet very targeted uh, you know, effect with the drowning, okay? We get global damage, which is always noted in the MRI. But whenever I take a look at them and, and I start to note, okay, well, this network is highly involved. This network is highly involved. The vagal network, the, you know, the ponds, the medu you know, all these things, you start to see areas really start to, to come out uh, on the exam. And that's because those networks were, most met were more metabolically active at the time of trauma, okay? So what networks... Uh, were more prone to damage, you know, maybe there was already an inflammatory event going on, maybe there was already some autoimmunity going on. Um, you know, I've heard 
um, you know, histories of, well, my kid, you know, before the accident had OCD and Tourette's or my kid was ADHD or, you know, I hear these stories and there was already a brain imbalance. There was already, um, you know, a, a functional disconnection. There was already lack of integrity or connectivity in certain brain networks. And that's going to look different than someone that didn't have that with a brain injury. Okay. We're opposing networks developed while the others were still developing and then you had this loss, right? And so basically if these left prefrontal networks were developed, we were developing the right prefrontal networks and then we had an, an injury and we lost more integrity in the right, well, that can look like something like OCD or tics, right? Or we can develop rage or anger. That, that's what that situation looks like, okay? Maybe there's a movement disorder because the basal ganglia were affected where you know the, the direct pathway uh, maybe the direct pathway was spared where the indirect pathway was not. And then we're, we're getting all this, um, you know, hyperactive type of movement or just the opposite. And it's a bradykinetic or they, you know, they can't move, right? So all these things matter and it paints the picture of that person and that injury. So this is the blueprint, right? This is, this is it. This is the cool thing, right? So let's talk through this. So we're born, right? We're born and our sensory systems kick on and we start to develop this muscle tone, all right? Muscle tone is very important because it's very reflective of brain tone, right? Our brain sets the tone of our muscles. And so by examining our muscles, it tells us a lot about our brain, okay? So we develop muscle tone. We don't wanna see asymmetry. We don't wanna see imbalances, right? Range of motion and flexibility matter, okay? Then we develop our primitive reflexes. Now, these primitive reflexes are there for a reason. Most of you in this community know about primitive reflexes, some of you do not. Okay, so let me kind of explain this. Primitive reflexes are there to mature your brain. Okay, so let's just take, you know, the, the rooting or the palmer grass. So let's say the palmer grass, right? So if I strike the palm, okay, touch the palm of someone with an intact uh, palmer grass reflex, you'll see the hands start to contract. You might just see a little muscle contraction, okay? You might barely see a muscle contraction, or it might be a full bone gla uh, grasp with maybe a cortical fist, right? Or a, or a weak fist or something, right? Um, all those things tell me something different, but basically this reflex, you have a sensory experience, a motor response, that feeds a specific network in the brain, okay? And you do it over and over and over again, and it develops that network in the brain. And when that network in the brain develops and matures, it then shuts down that primitive reflex. It says, you know what, I'm developed, thank you, now let's turn off, okay? Now we become less reflexive in nature and we can move voluntarily on our own, okay? So that's the primitive reflex loop. Um, very, very important to note this because Primitive reflexes mainly come from our brainstem, right? Because once our frontal lobes develop, it inhibits a lot of those brainstem reflexes, okay? We're gonna talk uh, more about this for sure. So typically by age one to two, we're, we should not have any more primitive reflexes intact, all right? So if they're there, it's, you know, we need to pay attention to this. Uh, so primitive reflexes, then we develop our postural core stability, okay? Then we develop our gross motor stability. This can be like our shoulders, our hips, our proximal muscles. Um, and then by about age two or so, uh, we develop a dominance profile. You know, most people are gonna be right-eyed, right-eared, right-hand, and right-footed, okay? What we don't want is we don't want a mixed dominance profile. There's literature on this. We don't want a right eye, left hand, left foot, right, or, you know, left ear, right foot situation. We want everything down to one side. Okay, there's a small percentage that can be ambidextrous and there's, you know, five to 10% of us that's true, you know, left-handed. Those individuals should be left eyed, left ears, left hand, left foot. Okay, so we want a clear dominance profile. Then we see the development of our autonomic and social development. This is highly vagal. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about the vagal system. All right. Then we start to look at our vestibular development, all right? We have our vestibular otoliths, which is a part of our inner ear and the semicircular canals. Now, the otolith has to do with head body stability. So if, I, if my body moves, 
my head reflexively writes itself so my eyes stay even with the horizon, right? This is your otolith, it's your otolith, okay? Then our semicircular canals, this is our head eye stability, right? So now as my head moves in space, right? So if I gaze fixate on something, my head moves, my eyes can stay fixed on a target, okay? This is via the semicircular canals, okay? We then develop what's called an optokinetic reflex. These are reflexes within the eyes. You'll see various practitioners check this with like striped, you know, striped pieces of cloth or like I use an iPad that has stripes or characters that go, you know, in various directions up, down, left, right. Um, and your eyes will reflexively move, you know, in the direction that you're testing. Um, if you haven't started to develop these networks, then you won't have that reflex, right? And then you develop your gaze stability. And then we develop our cortex and that's going to be, you know, our voluntary movement, vision, more autonomic and social engagement control, so on and so forth, right? That's what makes us human, okay? So if we're missing, you know, some, some, if we still have some permanent reflexes intact, if we still have lack of postural core stability, we don't have a clear dominance profile, we have vagal dysfunction, so on and so forth, why then would we jump straight into the vestibular system and just start hammering that out? You know, that that's what doesn't make sense. And that's something that's honestly given, you know, some of us in functional neurology somewhat of a, a bad name because we're putting someone with poor muscle tone, primitive reflexes and all the rest into, you know, a more of a vestibular environment and really just trying to create change there. And we're bypassing a lot of these very important vital steps that our brain has wired for a reason to develop itself. Right. So we're just acknowledging and using and leveraging the brain's own internal wiring and developmental strategies. Right. That's really what this all is. OK. So very important there. Talk about more about brain development in and of itself. So basically with brain with the brain, you see it grows, it myelinates. So myelin is like a fatty sheath around the nerves. You get an increased speed of conduction. And then we start to get what's called short range connectivity. And this is intrahemisphere, right? So short range connectivity is the hemisphere connecting within itself, right? The, the, left, fit, the left hemisphere has a lot of short range connections. The right hemisphere has what's called more long range connectivity or long range uh, connections. And that's what's really syncing up, right? So we get our short range connectivity which localizes function within the hemisphere. Uh, and then we get integration or functional connectivity with long range connectivity, synchronizing those two hemispheres and synchronizing everything within the brain, right? Uh, and then we get a lateralization, okay? Lateralization, this is where um, our hemispheres really turn into that right and left side. Uh, we start to get top down regulation and inhibit the brainstem reflexes, right? Now, something to note here is that there's a, a definite connection between movement and cognition, okay, and neurobehavioral disorders, right? So basically, it's like this. <clears throat> uh, if, you, if you note that there's an asymmetry or an imbalance of muscle tone, maybe there's persistent primitive reflexes, uh, there's, you know, prenatal neurological imbalances, so on and so forth, right? This can lead to a developmental asynchrony. What do I mean by that? That means things didn't sync up, right? The brainstem's not fully integrated. There's what we call bottom-up interference, right? All right. So we get, so again, we have abnormal muscle tone, unintegrated brainstem. This leads to what's called a dysmetria of movement or just abnormal movement, uncoordinated movement, right? Now, if there's uncoordinated movement, there's going to be what's called a thalamocortical dysrhythmia. All that, that's just a fancy word for this information that's coming up through the cerebellum into the thalamus and supposed to be projected into the cortex, okay? The cortex, again, is our higher, you know, our highest level brain, okay? Then there's going to be a dysrhythmia. It's not going to be coming up there at the right speed or frequency or velocity that it should, right? That's going to desynchronize our hemispheres, okay? Remember, those long range connections won't fully develop. It's going to desynchronize our hemispheres. And that's how we get what's called a functional disconnection. Okay. And now we have an unevenness of skills, right? Um, so that's, I know that that might be, that this is a, a whole lot of boiled down condensed information in this one slide. I could talk about this for an hour. Um, but I just, again, I just want you to see 
how important it is that things develop in the right order at the right time and we don't skip steps. That's really what, I, what I'm saying here. It's super important to pay attention to this and to know how to be able to integrate these networks at the right time. Okay, so important. There's lots of research on this. Um, you know, this is a great paper talking about the ontogenesis of lateralization. Um, this is a quote from the study that I really like. It says, studying asymmetry can provide the most basic blueprints for how the brain is organized, says lead author Oner Gunturkin uh, of the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at Ruhr University, Bochum in Germany. It gives us an unprecedented a window into the wiring of the early developing brain that ultimately determines the fate of the adult brain. Because asymmetry is not limited to human brains, a number of animal models have emerged that can help unravel both the genetic and epigenetic foundations for the phenomenon of lateralization. Gunturkin says that this research can provide insight into the effects of asymmetry on brain conditions in humans. There are almost no disorders of the human brain that are not linked to brain asymmetries, okay? It's in the, le the literature. You understand that? that we're not the only ones saying this. He says, if we understand the ontogeny of lateralization, we can make a great leap to see how brain wiring early in the developmental process may go wrong in these pathological cases. So again, it's saying, if there's a problem with the early developmental wiring of the brain, it can lead to an altered adult brain. That's what this is saying. It's saying, hey, slow down. We have to pay attention to how the brain wires itself and then lateralizes and becomes a right and a left hemisphere because that ultimately dictates who you are and who you become, okay? Just more quotes that I love. This is Luco Zellino. He's out of Pepperdine. He's a neuropsychiatrist. He says, uh, when one or more neural networks necessary for optimal functioning remain underdeveloped, underregulated, or underintegrated with others, we experience the complaints and symptoms for which people seek therapy. And then Dr. Malillo, this is out of his textbook. All of the conditions that adversely affect behavior and learning are actually related to one problem, an imbalance of electrical activity between areas of the brain, especially the right and left hemispheres. There is even a name for it, functional disconnection or functional disconnection syndrome, okay? So now we're going to talk about that bottom up development, okay? I'm not gonna leave you hanging. I'm not just gonna throw out these terms, you know, and make you figure it out for yourself. Again, there's a lot of information in what I'm giving you, but I have to do this because this information is so vital, all right? It's so important and I need you to understand it, okay? So we're gonna be talking about the brainstem in these slides, okay? So there's the picture. You see how the brainstem kind of fits in under uh, the cerebrum, the cerebrum there is the cortex that I referred to earlier, right? So the cortex uh, is what finally matures, uh, you know, as, as you, you, you know, get into your adult years. Um, you know, men typically, you know, 25, 30 years old, they have a fully developed cortex. Women typically about 20, uh, 20 to 25, depending on who you quote. Um, and so, but first, you know, we have to look at the development of the brainstem. This is where all your vital centers are, your heart rate, respiration, you know, all of, all of these things um, and many, many more things. So let's talk about this. So going from the bottom up, all right, the first thing is the medulla, okay? I call this the basement of the brainstem. I want to take, I just want to walk through the brainstem and I want you to understand, um, you know, some of the, the, the main groups of nuclei and their functions and how we can leverage these things to, to turn on different parts of the brainstem. All right. So in the medulla, we have what's called a solitary nucleus. This is taste, has to do in part with the gag reflex. Uh, we all know what the gag reflex is. And then the carotid reflex or the carotid body reflex is where you can push on the carotid body and the neck and it'll bring your heart rate and blood pressure down. You let go and it rebounds back up. Uh, so this is the solitary nucleus in the medulla. The trigeminal nuclei, okay, this is the largest group of nuclei in the brainstem. It runs the entirety, the full length of the brainstem. So it's in the medulla pons and the midbrain. All right, but this is very receptive to vibration 
vibration on the face and the mouth, okay? It has to do with muscles and mastication as well. But this is why almost everyone that comes into my office, they leave with home care to vibrate their face, all right? Vibrate their face and in their mouth. I love using the Resimax. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic tool that was developed um, by Dr. Sherrick Peck. I did a great job, um, but I'll vibrate the face with it. And this brings in a lot of blood flow and really activates all those uh, nuclei in the entire brainstem. Very powerful thing to do. Then we have the cochlear nuclei, which has to do with sound. This is our acoustics and our music. Music is highly healing for the brain. Okay, you're, you're going to see it affects the brain stem, the cortex. It can affect the entire brain, right? But the cochlear nuclei are in the medulla. And then we have the vestibular nuclei, all right? The vestibular nuclei, not the semicircular canals and the otoliths, right? These are the nuclei in the brainstem that you know, talk to the semicircular canals and the otolith, right? So the vestibular nuclei uh, have to do with head and trunk movements. We kind of talked about the otolith and semicircular canals, eye movements, okay, all those things. Um, but yeah, this is in the medulla and partly in the pons as well. Uh, the inferior olive, okay, the olive is highly connected to the cerebellum. We're going to talk about that too, don't worry. But the olive is going to help to set your muscle tone, all right? So the olive um, oscillates at about 8 to 12 hertz, which is your what we call a physiologic tremor, right? So our muscles are turning on and off at a rate of 8 to 12 hertz, all right? Now, when it starts to slow down, we'll start to see that physiologic tremor come out, all right? So, but what I want you to know is that the olive, together with the cerebellum, really set the tone of your muscles, okay? has a lot to do with learning and those types of things. Um, you may see palatal, which is your, your soft palate in your mouth. You'll, you might see it start to tremor. Um, there's a genetic condition called hypertrophic olivary degeneration, uh, which you know that can indicate, but I've also seen it to where there's a functional problem with the olive. You'll start to see, um, it, it almost starts to undulate. The soft palate will start to tremor almost, uh, and that's linked to olivary dysfunction. Um, projections into the olive, you know, there's, there's some that come from the midbrain. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, and how we can access that as well. Okay, more in the medulla, we have the hypoglossal nucleus. This is our motor uh, to our tongue. So it's our ability to move our tongue. Uh, and then we have our dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. This is motor to the GI tract and the organs. Okay, so it makes our organs and our GI tract move and go. Uh, this is also the older part of the vagal system. We're going to talk about that more. Uh, and then we have what's called the nucleus ambiguous. This is traditionally known for swallowing and speaking, uh, but this is actually the newest part of the vagal system. Again, we're going to go through the vagal system. You'll understand that more. Uh, highly, you know, control social engagement and safety uh, and things like that. Moving on to the pons, again, we have the trigeminal nuclei, which we already talked about. Um, the abducens, uh, which moves the eyes out or lateral, okay? That's cranial nerve six, the abducens nucleus. And we have our facial nerve nucleus, cranial nerve seven. This is muscles to the face, facial expression, and part of taste, okay? Um, more on the pons, we have our vestibulocochlear nuclei. Um, Again, so we already talked about that. Moving up into the midbrain, okay, so now we're in that purple region there, the midbrain. Um, this is the, you know, we find the oculomotor nucleus, cranial nerve three. Uh, this is where most of our eye movements come from. We have our trochlear nucleus, which is cranial nerve four. Uh, this controls the superior oblique muscles in the eyes. It moves the eyes down and out. You test it with down and in gaze, just like that. That's how you test it, all right. Uh, we have our red nucleus, which is, it controls the proximal muscles around our shoulder. So it has to do with arm swing, um, what we call brachiation. So sometimes you'll see me like hold a kid up by his arms and start swinging them around. This is to drive brachiation, all right? Um, you know, we, we hear that term a lot with monkeys swinging through trees, right? Uh, they have a very well-developed red nucleus and rubrospinal tract that leads into the midbrain. Um, so, 
when I'm pulling a kid or when a kid's on monkey bars or pulling themselves up, climbing trees, all these things are good for them because it drives, you know, midbrain development. That red nucleus actually shoots down into the olive, right, into the inferior olive and helps to develop, you know, muscle tone, motor coordination, all those things as well. So it's a very important um, thing to do. And then we also have our tectospinal reflexes. Um, so I don't know if you can see, you know, there on the midbrain, and you see four little bodies, um, four little outpouchings behind the midbrain. Those are the superior and inferior colliculi. Um, and what happens is uh, the top ones, the superior colliculi, have to do with light or fast moving light, like especially in our periphery. We'll have a flash of light and we turn towards it, right? That's our tectospinal reflex. And then the ones under it, the inferior colliculi, you'll have a sound, like a loud sound, and you turn towards it, right? That is a reflex. So I'll actually use that therapeutically sometimes. I'll use a sound or a flash of light and we'll have people turn their heads towards the stimulus. That's activating the midbrain. This is also where the Moro reflex and the startle reflex come from. We're gonna talk about that too, all right? Now, primitive reflexes and how they relate to uh, the brainstem. Now, there's a lot more reflexes than what I'm going to list, yes, but we've chosen these for specific reasons to really focus on. We obviously, we look at way more than this, okay, we do, um, but we know that these specific reflexes come from, you know, these specific regions in the brainstem. So from our pons and medulla is honestly where you see a lot of these reflexes coming from, okay. So that's the Babinski, which is, you know, if this is my foot instead of my hand and you strike on the palm of the foot, and you see the, the, the toes curl back, especially the big toe go back or up towards you. Uh, that's the Babinski. You have a palmer grass, like I talked about earlier, a rooting reflex, which is, you know, you strike the face and the, the lips contract and they may turn towards you and try and latch on for breastfeeding. Um, our tonic labyrinthine reflex, which we turn our, we tilt our head back uh, and it stabilizes our body. It actually activates our reticular activating system. Um, or we tilt forward and we stay stabilized. It's our ability to stabilize our spine. Our asymmetric tonic neck reflex, uh, we turn our head, we might see the opposite arm uh, weaken, or this has to do with our, uh, our fencer poses, our symmetric tonic neck reflex, spinal gallant and spinal uh, perez uh, reflexes as well. These are all related to the medulla and the pons and the midbrain. So if these reflexes are still present after one to two years old, depending on which one we're talking about, some of them six months, right? So depending on which one, they each integrate at different uh, timeframes. But if these are still present, it means we have unintegrated networks in our brainstem and definitely under development in the higher order cortex and the higher order brain centers that these then feed up into, right? So if these are present, that's telling us there's unintegration in the brainstem in the brain. In the midbrain or the mesencephalon, okay, same thing, you know, just different words, same area of the brain. Uh, we have the Moreau and the startle reflex, right? So you can see this come out in various ways. Um, sometimes it's just not present. It has not formed yet, right? So if there's a loud sound or, you know, a flashing light or something like that, and, and the person is just completely unresponsive at all, um, it may have never developed, right? Or maybe they developed it and now they've integrated it, but, you know, more clinical information is needed at that time. They have a loud sound and the person starts really strong and then they can't calm themselves down. Their heart rate remains elevated. You know, in, in some of these brain injuries, what we'll see is the eyes start to, to have a, a upward beating nystagmus um, or, you know, they start to move up really fast. And that's because uh, in the rostral or the top of the midbrain, you have a, a group of nuclei called the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, and that moves the eyes uh, vertically. So uh, that can be a sign, you know, that, that that reflex is not fully integrated yet, right? So this can present in several different ways. Uh, it can also present when you're falling back, right? This is when you're setting, laying a baby down, um, you know, in a, in a baby bed or something, and they, they start, they go into that extension, they start to cry, uh, and that kind of thing, right? Um, so that's the Moreau and the startle pointing to an unintegrated midbrain region, right? So let's just pause just for a second again, um, because there's a lot of 
uh, functional neurologists out there and, and they're doing good work, okay? But I just want to pose this question, right? Does it make sense if you have intact primitive reflexes and unintegrated brainstem and imbalances in muscle tone to put that person into a gyrostem, which is really, you know, the gyrostem is that fancy machine that you strap someone into and they start moving you all around in all these different types of directions, right? Because does that make sense? Because you're really, you're kind of, you're bypassing several levels of development, right? You saw the developmental blueprint, right? You're going through so many different levels when you just go straight for the vestibular system. So even if you do get improvements, they may only be transient because again, those those lower order networks, right? Those, those things in the medulla, the pons and so on and so forth have not integrated and solidified and, and stabilized, right? So they're not firing into the vestibular system to keep it alive and to keep it functional, right? So we can target it, we might get some changes in muscle tone and so on and so forth, right? But hey, if it's the right time for it, it's the right time for it and that's great, it's a fantastic modality. I'm not saying anything bad about it, I'm saying let's use it when it's time to use it, right? Make sense? Okay, just trying to put all this together for you because I know that you know there's so many options out there for therapy and for you know things to do. I just want you to have all the information and be able to think through this logically. Okay, so now we're moving into the vagal system. Um, this is a very, very, very important system. Um, very wide reaching, has implications in various uh, body systems and brain development and whatnot. Uh, so let's get into it. So the vagal system is composed of more than just the vagus nerve. That's something to note. It helps us with organ function, our safety, our social engagement, controls blood flow to the brain and the organs. It mediates inflammation. It helps with our hormones, our growth factors, uh, all of these different things, right? It's a very wide reaching system, okay? There's different parts to its development, right? And this is, honestly, if you go get an older um, neurophysiology textbook or neurology textbook, that this information will not even be in there, right? So this is, um, you know, some newer information. It's out there. What, what I want you to do is read uh, Polyvagal Theory by Dr. Porges. Dr. Porges was a pediatric cardiologist and he noted um, some problems with sinus uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia in babies. Um, and that's how he started to understand how this vagal system really developed. So let's kind of talk about it a little bit to add some context so that you understand it a little bit more. Um, so first, we have our unmyelinated vagal pathways. This is the older system, right? This comes on first, okay? Um, it's connected with the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. It provi provides primary vagal regulation to organs below the diaphragm. Um, it decreases um, activity to visceral organs. What I want you to think about with this system is your life threat system, okay? So this system will kick on in an animal or a reptile so that it can feign death, so it can fake death, right? And so what happens is um, when there's a predator or there's, you know, a scary situation, um, it'll, the system will kick on and go, okay, I have to protect myself. Let's lower the heart rate, lower the metabolic demands of my body, reduce my respiration to almost nothing, right? And so reptiles can like lay underwater for forever, right? Uh, whenever the system kicks on. Or think of a possum. Whenever a, a possum is uh, in trouble, it'll fake death, right? This is the system that's, going, that's, that's you know, being turned on at that point in time. Humans have this system too, okay? Any type of syncope or fainting episodes or that feeling that you're, you know, you're kind of lightheaded and you're about to pass out or you, know, you get so scared that you faint, uh, that actually happens. Now, it shouldn't happen because there's other systems, higher order systems that we're gonna go over that should shut this system down but it does happen in some people, and that's showing a, you know, a big breakdown in the vagal integrity, all right? So that's the older system, um, the unmyelinated system. And then what happens is we develop our sympathetic nervous system. So this is next in development. This influences organ function, increases activity of visceral organs. It opposes the unmyelinated vagal system. So this system turns on and goes, hey, no, don't fake death. That, that thing's still going to eat you. Get up and run away or fight, 
So this is our fight or flight, right? So most people know about our fight or flight system, our sympathetics, right? Um, so a lot of us right now are stuck in a fight or flight, okay? Because we're so stressed out about something, okay? So that's the sympathetic nervous system. And then we have our myelinated. This is the newest part of the vagal system, right? So this is the last in development. This is connected to the nucleus ambiguous. This is the area of the brainstem that controls muscles of the face, head, and voice. This is our social engagement system, right? So my, you know, the way my, my face is moving and my, my hand gestures and my shoulders and all these types of things. Um, this reads other people, this creates, you know, your, your persona of, of things, how you, how you like to, you know, talk and, and interact with others. Um, so that's that. So traditionally, um, you know, what's, what's thought of is just your parasympathetic and your sympathetic tone, right? But that parasympathetic, the resting digesting system is actually divided into that unmyelinated vagal system and the myelinated vagal system. Okay. So that's really what, what I'm talking about here. Okay. I hope that's not too much, but again, I want you to understand this stuff because a lot of kiddos and a lot of adults that come in here with a brain injury, there's almost always a vagal system component at hand, right? So we always have to activate the vagal system in some way. It's so far reaching, okay? So cool article here, you know, vagal activity is associated with both infant growth and infant socio-emotional development. Vagal activity has been noted to increase following the stimulation of pressure receptors as in massage therapy. So we can use, you know, abdominal massage, we can use deep pressure on muscles to activate the vagal system, vibration, um, smells, we can use um, all sorts of ways to turn on the vagal system. Um, so yeah, it's a cool article there. Uh, early development of the autonomic nervous system provides neural platforms for, for social behavior. A polyvagal perspective. Again, this is Dr. Porges. Okay. Um, what is he saying here? He's saying, um, so I'll read it and then kind of break it down. As the infant matures, the special visceral efferent, that's motor, pathways are recruited by cortical bulbar pathways and expressed through social engagement behaviors. Autonomic support for these muscles is provided by the myelinated vagus, right? We just talked about that the myelinated vagus, which can be dynamically monitored by quantifying respiratory sinus arrhythmia, okay? This is where you take a breath and it changes your heart rate. This is something that they monitor in infants. Um, this face-heart connection, right? Because cortical bulbar pathways controls facial tone, okay? So they're saying facial tone has an implication for heart function right? That's what he's saying here. Okay, provides the necessary elements for an integrated social engagement system. Since the structures involved in the neural regulation and coordination of the striated muscles involved in sucking, swallowing, vocalizing, and breathing are all linked to the myelinated vagus, the newest part, the nucleus ambiguous, right? The functioning of these behaviors and the link between these behaviors and respiratory sinus arrhythmia may provide an early indicator of the functional status of a system that will later be involved in social engagement behaviors. So basically, why am I telling you this? Because facial tone, soft palate tone, respiration, heart rate, all of these are posture, right? All of these things tell us a lot about our brain. Do you understand? So all of these things tell us. So when, when you have a doctor that says, you know what, it doesn't matter that half of your kid's face looks like it's melting. That has nothing to do with the brain injury. You can look at them and say, you're full of crap. And here's research that says why. Okay, we have to be holding these doctors accountable because this information is out there and it's vital for the development and, and the healing of so many people. Symptoms of a dysfunctional vagal system. If, if you have something going on, these are just the most common ones. I could not list all the ones, okay? This is the most common. So gut or GI issues, right? Um, dry eyes, dry mouth, startle easily, right? You're easily startled. Uh, fatigue, chronic fatigue, trigger points and the traps, right? 
PTSD, post-traumatic uh, post, uh, traumatic stress disorder, uh, general autonomic dysfunction like heart rate, rhythm problems, blood pressure, breathing, respiration problems, sweating problems, blood flow issues, uh, heat and cold intolerance, so on and so forth, right? Chronic pain, huge implication with chronic pain, mental illness, things like depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, all these things. There's an implication with the vagal system and obviously our neurodevelopmental disorders as well. And there is research with neurodevelopmental disorders and actually activating the vagal system via the auricular branch of the vagus nerve in the ear and seeing uh, improvement in um, autism spectrum disorders, quite impressive, okay? Again, some signs of a dysfunctional vagal system, right? How can you identify these things? Facial asymmetries, right? So my kids know when the left side of my face starts to droop, I'm really tired, right? So that's, you know, that's my facial asymmetry. It points to my weaker left hemisphere, which I work on all the time. But whenever I get tired, it comes out, right? So facial asymmetries, and we're going to go through those. Soft palate, right? In the mouth, you have the uvula. On either side, you have you know, a, a muscle, if one side's dropping down, it's going to tell us here's a vagal problem. Um, phonetic dysfunction, right? So speech or sound dysfunction, um, unable to control breath, you know, to speak, um, social anxiety, fainting and syncope like we already talked about, right? All right, so that's vagal. Now we're going to move on into the cerebellum. So I love the cerebellum. It sits back here, um, you know, where kind of where the, the head meets the neck, um, you know, and there you, you kind of see it on the back corner. It's down in the very, you know, my right hand corner of the screen, <clears throat> a real colorful picture there uh, of the brain showing all the different connections going on in the brain. Super cool um, there. So I love the cerebellum. Um, the cerebellum coordinates our life, okay? I want you to, when we talk about the cerebellum, I want you to think about um, the conductor of a symphony, right? The cerebellum is sitting there conducting the symphony within our brain, okay? It's controlling our muscle tone, our balance coordination, the coordination of muscles, the coordination of our immune system, coordination of our thoughts, right? And I'm going to show you some really cool research on how the cerebellum can, uh, coordinates our thoughts as well, okay? So what is the cerebellum and what does it do in the human brain? Well, in the past, the answer would be that it only contributes to motor performance and skill. Still, we recognize its contribution to motor control. However, to limit its function to only motor coordination is a great understatement to say the least. Recent evidence has shown that the cerebellum's contribution to control of all brain functions, especially cognitive and behavioral controls, may be just as great as its control over motor functions. In fact, we will see how the cerebellum may in fact be the key to normal cognitive and emotional development of the brain and is in fact the key to learning anything, whether it is motor or cognitive learning. Cool, that's out of Dr. Malolo's textbook. This is a really cool study. Uh, this was done in 2018 uh, and what it says is this. Look, only about 20% of the cerebellum is really dedicated um, to areas that involve physical motion. This is our motor control, right? 80%, the majority, 80% was dedicated to areas involved in functions such as abstract thinking, planning, emotion, memory, and language. All right, so this, this thing back here, all right, this cerebellum, it coordinates everything, right? But it's controlling our thoughts. It's controlling and coordinating our speech. Okay. It's helping with our emotions and our memory. It, it's like the epicenter of our brain. All right. It's super, super important. It's also very, um, well, we're going to get to it. So just another area of this article says we have an explanation for all the bad ideas people have when they're drunk. He says they're lacking cerebellar editing of their thoughts, right? So when you drink, it actually has a a greater effect on the cerebellum, especially the anterior cerebellum, which is why you get that wide, unsteady gait. Um, so there you go. So I love this um, research article. Uh, Doc, Datis Karazian did this uh, several years ago, and it's talking about the neuroendocrine immunology mechanisms of subtle cerebellar impairment. All right, so let's talk about it a little bit. So 
We know about, you know, the cerebellum, so let's just read this. So the cerebellum degeneration and impairment may occur. Um, I can't read that part because my image is there, but clinically obvious and subtle mechanisms. Obvious mechanisms of cerebellum disease include acute onset found with trauma and vascular lesions, com compressive signs found with tumor, infectious mechanisms associated with fever, and abnormal immune serology and genetic patterns that have distinct identifying clinical features, right? So those are the obvious ones, right? If you have a stroke, if you have a tumor, if you have these things, right, that's obvious insult, right? But there can also be subtle neuroendocrine immune mechanisms. Now this, now we're talking about, remember, in the beginning, we talked about fuel and activation. So we're talking about things that can hinder the fuel component of developing the cerebellum or other parts of the brain, okay? so. Subtle neuroendocrine immune mechanisms that can impair and degenerate the cerebellum include gluten-specific cross-reactivity. You mean gluten can attack the brain? I mean, gluten can attack, or your, your immune system can attack that gluten, and then it can get confused and start to attack the brain, the cerebellum especially, right? Because those gluten proteins and peptides look very similar to cerebellum, thyroid, skin, and gut tissue, right? And so there's a big cross reactivity if you're sensitive to gluten, that you're also going to attack your cerebellum, your thyroid, your skin, or your gut, all right? So gluten specific cross reactivity, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, that's a thyroid autoimmune condition, Hashimoto's, but again, the thyroid tissue looks similar to the cerebellar tissue, to the cerebellum, right? So if you have that autoimmune disease, very common, you start to attack your cerebellum too. Hypothyroidism, you have thyroid receptors scattered throughout your whole brain. Blood sugar dysregulation or dysglycemia, subtle cerebellum autoimmunity. Okay, so you can just have cerebellar autoimmune issues, right? And then we need to find and mitigate as many triggers as possible. Uh, we'll talk about that. Perineoplastic cerebellar syndrome or perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. That's where you actually have a cancer within the body. It's usually subclinical and you don't know about it, but it's causing an autoimmune attack on the cerebellum. Uh, it's rare. I've had some patients with that. It's not pretty. Um, or toxi toxicological insults to the cerebellum, uh, granulocytes and Purkinje cells. Um, so various types of mechanisms that may be going on, right? So again, fuel and activation. So we need to find and eliminate as many problems with that fuel as we can, right? And this is what this is talking about. And this is why I like to run all the different labs that I run, like the wheat zoomer, right? We're looking at every possible component of gluten, food sensitivities along with allergies, okay? Chemical issues, environmental toxins, mycotoxins and molds, and then my absolute favorite, the Neural Zoomer Plus, which is looking at not just cerebellar autoimmunity, but brain autoimmunity, blood brain barrier integrity, infections in the brain, inflammation in the brain, all of these things, right? So I love the Neural Zoomer Plus. And the way I typically run this is I'll run the Neural Zoomer Plus. And then based on that, we can then go and investigate further if we need to, right? So that's typically how I do that. Now, um, the cerebellum, right? I love using the laser on the cerebellum. Um, hopefully you're gonna catch my, my other lecture as well. And, and so I talk about, you know, how the laser works, um, especially how it works, you know, really quickly. But basically the cerebellum is the most oxygen sensitive neurological tissue in the brain. Therefore, my preferred modality of, to affect the cerebellum is in fact laser therapy. Laser therapy will improve the overall voltage of the tissue via the photoelectric effect. Okay, and again, I go through all of that in my other lecture. Uh, this will do many things, but it will increase the amount of oxygen available at the cellular level, thus giving us an almost instant change in the cerebellar function. This will also allows for more ATP production to be made, right? So again, very important for all types of brain rehab. We need blood flow and oxygen uh, in the brain period. But, you know, especially with, you know, your anoxic, hypoxic type of brain injuries is super important uh, to use a modality that can safely increase blood flow and oxygen into the brain. Uh, laser therapy is, you know, proven time and time and time again uh, since 1960s to be very safe and effective. Um, you know, Harvard says it's, you know, one of the safest modalities we can use on the brain uh, and we should be using it on the brain. So very important. Uh, laser therapy is also neuroprotective. 
and will reduce things like inflammation and autoimmunity, which may be killing the cerebellum, preventing a patient from fully healing. And so basically, um, you know, if you do have that patient with autoimmune issues to the brain, um, you know, your immune system's attacking it, or you have, you know, all sorts of inflammation or even infections going on, um, this is a modality that will begin to work on all those things. Uh, so again, it's one of my preferred things to use on the brain for sure. Okay, we're, we're gonna make it. I hope you're all still with me. Okay, here we go. So now we're moving up into the hemispheres, right? So we talked about the brainstem, we talked about the vagal system, we talked about the cerebellum, uh, and now we're getting up into the hemispheres, right? The cortex. So this is the hemispheric model of healthcare. Um, it's the only model of healthcare that really makes sense in my opinion. Um, so let's talk about it. So functional disconnection syndrome. What is a brain imbalance? The most common brain imbalance occurs between the two hemispheres of the brain. Essentially, this is a lack of connection, communication, and integration between the networks in the brain. This lack of integration is most commonly a result of developmental imbalance, delay, or asynchrony. This means that one side of the brain was slower to develop, and this caused the other to grow and mature faster. This difference in growth and development prevents the two sides from properly integrating, okay? So this is, again, it's important to note, um, you know, whenever a brain injury happens or something like that, to note where you were in that developmental timeline. So you can go back and start again from there. Because remember, once the, the trajectory is altered, this will alter the type of human you ultimately become, right? unless we go back and we, we address those issues, okay? So this can result in an unevenness of functional abilities where one side of the brain is advanced or even too strong relative to the other side, which has skills and functions that are underdeveloped and weaker. This combination of strengths and weaknesses can result in many different types of physical, mental health, and learning issues that can last a lifetime. Right. So super important to note this kind of stuff, man. I'm telling you, it's not just about the person that you're watching this for. This information can apply to you, your other kids, other family members. That's why this model of healthcare just it needs to be learned about. It needs to be more widespread. And it is. It's growing. It's growing quickly. All right. It is. The cause of this. Uh, difference in brain function is multifactorial. Uh, we have things like environmental and lifestyle changes, you know, with the with computers and electronics and video games and all these things, we're not moving as much, right? Now, what did I say earlier? Movement and cognition. Movement and brain development is highly connected with each other, right? So if our kids are not outside moving, playing, climbing trees, playing tag, riding bikes, all of these things, they're sitting and they're being sedentary, they're not developing their brain like they should, right? This is going to lead to a developmental asynchrony, right? This is going to lead to underdevelopment within the brain, okay? Poor diets, causes a lot of inflammation, uh, maybe some autoimmunity, uh, and just doesn't feed our brain, right? Our brain has a nutrient demand. We, we have to get adequate nutrition into the brain too, right? Stress is huge. I could talk for five hours on that inflammation from various regions, reasons, brain injuries, like I talked about earlier, right? You can have an injury that alters the trajectory to brain development. Physical injuries, like what if you break your right arm and that decreases sensory information coming into your left hemisphere, right? Uh, autoimmunity epigenes, right? You've heard me say epigenes, epigenetics a few times. Let me just kind of expound on that. So you have genes and you have epigenes. So imagine this, you go into a library, there's library books, on you know the cases or whatever there's a bunch of books everywhere that's your genetic code it has all the information in the book right your epigene now imagine that there's a covering that has that has a lock and key right so you have to unlock that case to get the code to get the book right so that lock that shelf or, or the cover if you will that's your epigene right your environment is the key okay so your environment unlocks the epigene and allows for the genetic expression to be, or the genetic code to be expressed, right? So you're not subjected 
to your genetic code to a certain degree, right? Obviously, if there's an addition or a deletion to a genetic code, that's a little bit different story, right? But if heart disease runs in your family, just because of that doesn't mean you're going to die of heart disease. You can change that for yourself based on you, you know, leveraging your epigenes. Will it be harder for you than others? Yes, but you can do it, right? You have to alter your lifestyle in order to turn those epigenes off or that genetic code off, okay? Bruce Lipton is a good resource for epigenes. Okay, so let's try and tie all this together. There's a lot of information in this slide. Sorry about that. But again, I just want to, I want to bring this home. I want to bring this all, you know, together so we can kind of use this information best we can. Okay, so when we're born, we're primarily sympathetic in nature, right? So we talked about that sympathetic fight or flight, right? This is regulated by an area called the hypothalamus. It's the most rostral part of the sympathetic nervous system. Rostral means headward. Um, and the HPA, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. From the brain, you get regulation from the mesencephalon. We talked about that, it's the midbrain, which activates the sympathetic nervous system, which activates the IML, which stands for the intermedial lateral cell column. Uh, this fires into the upper brain stem. Uh, activates the spinal cord, but the brain can regulate, okay, can regulate all this via the vagal centers and the parasympathetics, right? When you're born, you're very right brain dominant, you're in protection mode, okay? Uh, you have a high heart rate, a higher blood pressure, you cannot digest your food, right? You have a leaky gut, so let's talk about that. So when you're born, you have this higher heart rate and you're in a higher blood pressure, uh, because those centers have not developed, because they're primarily re reflexive within the brainstem, right? So one thing that we see when we're born, we have a higher heart rate and a higher blood pressure. As we grow and mature and develop our brain, that heart rate and, and blood pressure comes down. Then as we get older and we start to degenerate in our brain, our heart rate and our blood pressure start to rise again. That's why you can't compare the blood pressure of a 65 year old to a 35 year old and expect them to be the same because they shouldn't be the same, right? The doctors do that all the time. Um, same thing. So when we're born, we have this uh, leaky gut. We should have a leaky gut as a baby because as we consume breast milk from the mom, um, those polypeptides, those protein structures, those amino acid sequences that are in foods are going through our gut lining and our immune system is looking at it and going, hey, my mom ate that, it's food, it's good for me, I should not attack it. That's not a bacteria, that's not a virus, I shouldn't attack it, right? That's called developing oral tolerance. Now, that happens until about one or two years old and then that gut should close. Again, why? Brain development. As the brain develops and matures, it's gonna help with closure of that leaky gut. Now, let me just, let's break into the functional medicine model for a little bit. They say, oh, you need, uh, you know, probiotics and you need, um, you know, to, to run your food panels and you need to, you do all these things. And those are good things. But what if you have underdeveloped networks in the brain constantly causing a stress reaction, constantly, you know, causing a leaky gut to happen. It doesn't matter how many times you change your food or how many probiotics you swallow, you're still going to have that unintegrated brain leading to a leaky gut, right? So as the brain grows and develops, uh, it starts to come down and inhibit the sympathetic, so fight or flight, and activates our resting, digesting, our parasympathetic tone, right? And this is where healing takes place. We can't heal if we're constantly stuck in that stressed out fight or flight mode, okay? So again, if the brain does not mature, then sympathetics remain dominant. Our fight or flight remains dominant, okay? So to say it a different way with decreased cortex development or decreased cortical development, right? Or decreased cortical function. We'll have increased sympathetics or fight or flight. And this makes it very difficult to function and properly heal. Um, just some things to talk about here, because we're gonna talk about how to identify weaknesses in the brain. So we're gonna talk about things called pyramidal signs. These are um, things that you can look at posturally, uh, muscle tone changes uh, due to brain dysfunction. So you have hard signs, you have soft signs. Hard signs is like you have a stroke in the right side of the brain, 
and you get this type of presentation. You get a flexed left upper extremity or lower extremity or whatever it may be. So that's that right side controlling the left side of the body. That's your cortical spinal tract. Um, but if you have a dysfunction, right? You have a dysfunction in the right hemisphere. This can actually weaken the right brain. You can actually see fallout down the same side of the body, right? So you have increased flexor tone down the same side of the body. I know that's kind of weird to think about, but but that's how it is. Um, and it's quite interesting. So some things to look at, right? So sorry, I'm not an artist. Uh, I just kind of drew this up. Uh, it's not the greatest, but hey, it has the information, right? So a decreased frontal lobe, right? Frontal lobe here. Um, you'll have increased sympathetic tone. That's your fight or flight, right? Okay. You'll see soft pyramidal signs. You'll have increased flexor tone down the same side of the weak cortex. Okay. Anterior muscles above T6. So the arm turns in. I'm going to show you a picture of this. Posterior muscles below T6 so that uh, your foot will turn out. So your arm will turn in, your foot will turn out. On the side of the weaker brain, so again, this is you know going down the right side, right weaker brain, you'll have a larger pupil that's less reactive to light. So when you shine a light in your eye, that pupil should constrict, get smaller, right? If that brain is weaker, it'll constrict and pop right back out, or it just won't move, right? And again, talking about the soft palate, we talked about the vagal system. Okay, if it's if you look in there and the uvula, the hanging down thing is there, and you have this less tone here, that's going to tell us probably more of a right brain weakness, same side, right? So th those are some things to look at. Here I typed it out for you, right? So in the face uh, and head, we have that larger eye, decreased tone in the facial muscles again. So I'll switch over to my left side, right? So now we're talking about a left brain weakness, right? You'll see that left side of the face start to droop. Um, you'll see the larger eye, larger pupil, less reactive to light lower side of the smile. So when you smile, it'll be lower. Okay. Like that, you have less tone. You can have a head tilt to the same side. It might rotate away. Head tilt is not always indicative. It can go either way based on otolith function, right? So you can't always go off the head tilt, but typically with the left brain weakness, you'll have weakness down the left side of the face, left head tilt, maybe rotated away. Uh, again, the eye, we talked about that. In the mouth, you'll see the lower soft pot, soft palate on the side of the weaker brain. And again, the arm will rotate in. You can count more knuckles and the leg will rotate out. I'll show you pictures of that, right? So this is Scott. He's an amazing guy. Um, I talk a little bit more about him in my laser lecture, but you can see his face, how his right side of his face has less tone than the left side of his face. You see how he's smiling and on the left side of his face, his mouth is moving more, his eye is contracting more, right? So there's more tone, better muscle tone in the left side of his face, right? So this is telling me that, hey, maybe he has more of a right brain weakness from a functional perspective, right? Uh, looking at the soft palate, right? So you see the, the little hangy down thing there in the back, the uvula, right? On the patient's right side, Okay, so if you're looking at the screen, it's your left side, but on the patient's right side, you see how that arch is lower than the other side, right? That's less tone. That's a muscle. Less tone in that muscle, telling me that probably a weaker right side of the brain in this person. And definitely vagal system dysfunction, right? This is my kiddo, Nolan. Um, so this is one of the, this is first day of school. I think it was like third grade, maybe. Um, but what do you see? You see, let's just start at the foot, the left foot turning outward. You see the left arm is slightly rotated inward. See the left side of the face has slightly less tone. So now I'm going into, you know, this is my kiddo. I mean, he's highly function. He's highly functioning. There's nothing wrong with him per se. Uh, but you can see these imbalances play out uh, when there's nothing apparently wrong, but you can start to see these things, right? All right, so that would be more of a left brain weakness in him. This is on the cover of, you know, Scientific American. Um, again, looking at the face. The face is so indicative uh, of what our brain is doing. Again, it tells us about the vagal system, our brain stem. Uh, you can get cortical representations on here too. Uh, so you see how the right side of this guy's face has less tone than the left, okay? So you, you can start looking at people and start noting, hey man, you got a jacked up brain. There you go. <clears throat> okay. 
Coming into the home stretch, I promise. All right, you're doing great. If you need to pause me, pause me. Hope your, your brain hasn't exploded yet. But we're getting close, real close, promise. All right, so now we're gonna move into, you know, even more. We're gonna go, we're, we're talking about the hemispheres. Now we're gonna really talk about the lateralization, the side to side, how the brain really splits, right? How we have these two minds, if you will. Um, which is what Dr. McKilchrist calls it in his work. Uh, so we have a right brain and a left brain. So with brain development, the right brain develops first in utero up to about two years old and the left brain begins to develop more. The hemispheres then volley back and forth in their, their development throughout life. The right brain networks are needed to develop left brain networks, right? So the right brain helps to develop the left brain. That's why it develops first. The left brain actually likes to inhibit the right brain. It's kind of funny how that works. Now, something that's interesting, and this probably won't you know, uh, mean anything to the majority of you, but if, if anyone has a, a background in neuroscience, the corpus callosum, which is the connecting fibers between the right and the left brain, it's mainly inhibitory fibers. So it's not really there to connect the brain per se, it's there to inhibit one another so that you know, one can express its function and inhibit the other while the other expresses a function to inhibit the other, right? So basically for, uh, in the brain, for every network, there's an opposing network on the opposite side, right? So it's like the left side's a gas pedal on the right brain and the right side's the brake. Um, but like I said, for every network, there's an opposing network on the opposite side. Kind of funny how that works, like a seesaw. The right brain develops in utero up to about two years old. It's cautious, it's safe, it has to do more with withdrawal. It uses feelings and emotions it's big picture oriented, right? It's, it's looking at the forest instead of the leaves. It's imagination, it's very imaginative. Symbols and images, right? Uh, it's metaphorical. It uses alternative, alternate meanings, very fantasy based. It's more associated with negative emotions. Um, it has to do with nonverbal communication and facial recognition, right? So remember, this side of the hemisphere really comes online first, right? So we need to be able to recognize who our mom is, who, you know, bad people are, uh, be able to recognize the face, you know, is this person mad or sad or, or happy or whatever, uh, and communicate non-verbally with our facial expression, with our hands, with all these things, right? It's nonverbal communication. Right brain has to do with gross, motor, right? Our big muscles, postural, our core muscles, our postural muscles. Um, it's the brake pedal. So it'll tell us to slow down, to stop. It'll slow and modulate the immune system. We'll see that later. This is our emotional quotient, right? So everyone knows about IQ. That's more left brain. This is EQ, our emotional quotient. It has more receptors for serotonin and adrenaline. It stops and slows the immune response. Again, we're going to talk about that. And for those of you that might be interested, orgasm is actually highly right brain. And we'll see things like anorgasmia and orgasm dysfunction is typically more of a right brain uh, dysfunction or a weaker right brain individual, right? The left brain um, develops from two years on. It's more about curiosity and approach. It's linear, logical. It likes things to be nice you know, and organized. Uh, it, it likes for there to be a linear progression of things, right? Uh, very detail oriented, you know, give me the details, facts, give me the facts, don't make something up. I wanna know, I wanna see it, I wanna feel it, right? That's the left brain. Words, language, numbers, this is highly left brain, right? It's reality based, not fantasy, it's real. It wants to see it and feel it, touch it, smell it, right? And if it can't do that, it doesn't exist, right? That's the left brain. It really only deals with three emotions uh, is what Dr. McGilchrist is, uh, is outlining here uh, in his books that I've read. Happiness, anger, and dismissiveness, right? Those are the main three emotions of the left brain. The right brain can generate almost any emotion, right? All The majority of emotions come from the right brain, but happiness, anger, and dismissiveness really come from life, left brain. Um, again, the right brain can almost do anything the left brain can do, but the left brain is a lot more efficient at what it does, okay? Um, left brain, it's your fine motor dexterity, so your fine motor, not your gross motor, that's right, but your fine motor uh, dexterous things are, are more left brain 
Um, it's your gas pedal, right? Just go and do it. Just do it. Go, go, go. It's your IQ. There's more receptors for dopamine in acetylcholine in the left hemisphere. It initiates and increases the immune response. We'll see that. Uh, and you need the left hemisphere to initiate sexual arousal, especially the medial, the left medial temporal lobe in the amygdala uh, is actually where we see that. Pretty interesting, right? Um, but here's the thing, we need both. So I put this slide in uh, because both the right, you know, this is specifically talking about the right ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the left ventral medial prefrontal cortex. But look, you need both. You need both of your frontal lobes and your prefrontal cortices to turn on and to be nice and healthy, right? And when I talk about this, I talk about a dam, okay? So this is your frontal lobes is like a dam holding back your stress response, right? So I'm gonna try and bring all this home for you right now, right? So you grow this brain from the bottom up, from your brain stem all the way up into your cortex, into your cortex and you grow these nice, uh, you know, frontal lobes and it acts like a dam for your stress response, okay? Now, let's say you start to get a weakness in the dam or it never fully develops, that stress response is going to flow through that dam, right? Because it's not holding it back. It's gonna to start to escape and it flows down that same side of the body. Once it hits the adrenals, you get adrenaline produced and now you get a full body systemic effect, right? Okay, so that's how that works. Okay, here's some cool information, right? So right infant and childhood frontal lobe development asymmetry in the regulation of temperament and affect, right? So several early EEG studies of infants suggest that these functional brain asymmetries are present at least very early in life and possibly even at birth, if not before. Infants displaying elevated left frontal EEG asymmetry at rest have been reported to have easy temperaments manifested by reports of these infants being easily soothed and calmed. So these babies with higher functioning left brains, right? What did we say that they're associated with? Happiness, right? And so these babies with higher activity in the left hemisphere, they're more easily soothed, okay? They have more easy temperaments, right? So that colicky baby that's difficult to soothe, doesn't soothe, can't sell soothe, all that kind of stuff, that might be an implication for this where that, they, you know, they might be weaker on the left and stronger on the right, okay? There can be other implications, vagal system implications and other things, right? Research has also suggested that the right hemisphere has a preferential influence in regulating autonomic function. That right hemisphere is a little more connected to the vagal system, right? So we see that. Um, and this is talking about um, how the hemispheres control the immune response, right? I talk about this a whole lot, but this is coming out of the annals of neurology, okay? So cerebral lateralization may be important in neural control of immune function. Resections in the language dominant hemisphere. That's just saying the left hemisphere, right? I don't know why they couldn't just say left. They just wanted to, to sound fancy. I don't know. So resections, meaning they took out the left hemisphere, right? So they took out the left hemisphere in a patient with epilepsy, and they saw reduced lymphocytes, total T cells, and helper T cells. So the immune system plummeted when they took out the left. In contrast, resections in the, the language non-dominant, or the right hemisphere, increased the same cellular, cellular elements. So we take out the left, throw it away, immune system drops. We take out the right, throw it away, immune system elevates. So what's that telling us? So same thing with flare skin responses, right? Uh, was reduced by left cerebral resections, contrast with increase after right cerebral resection. So the left hemisphere ramps up our immune response, the right hemisphere dials our immune response down, okay? We're seeing that out of the annals of neurology from 2004, but no one's talking about it. No one except us. Kind of sad. I threw in a, a few more studies here just for you to take a look at. Um, I'm not going to go over them in detail. I just wanted you to see some different um, perspectives on this stuff. So brain imbalances will cause the following, right? So again, let's have some summary slides here. So we'll see muscular imbalances, we'll see tone imbalances in muscles, right? We'll see immune system imbalances. We'll see organ dysfunction, hormone imbalances, personality shifts, mental or cognitive issues, mood and affective issues, neurodevelopmental disorders, and a chronic stress 
response, right? Remember, we have our dams. If there's a problem with the dam, we're going to have a constant stress response escaping out of that, right? If we have imbalances with our nervous system, this will allow our sympathetics, that's our stress response, right? Our fight or flight, to fire too much for too long, okay? Too much sympathetic firing will lead to increased release of epinephrine. This is your adrenaline. Remember the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, right? That stress response goes down to the adrenals. Boom, adrenaline's flowing through your body, right? Results in glycogen breakdown to glucose. Why? So you can run away. So you can run away or fight, right? Um, also results in cortisol release leading to gluconeogenesis. This is just screwing up the blood sugar, right? Bad blood sugar problems. Therefore, you have an increased demand for B vitamins and oxygen to utilize the increased glucose properly, right? And minerals, 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 minerals. So you're sucking down your B vitamins and your minerals, your cofactors, all these things, right? You're sucking up your nutrient stores, okay? To, to, to utilize the increased glucose properly, right? Too much sympathetic firing results in a decrease of B vitamin reserves, mineral reserves, cofactors, all these things, all your nutrient reserves, resulting in decreased Krebs cycle activity, right? This means your energy goes down and your systems begin to break down. Krebs cycle, that means a piece of fatty acid goes into this thing called the Krebs cycle and you produce what's called ATP. ATP is like the gasoline for your cells, okay? So if you have this nice oxygenated system and you're not in this fight or flight system, uh, two, you know, molecule, you know, two mo molecules of fatty acid goes in and you get 38 molecules of ATP that's generated. If you're in what we call, what I call a low voltage state, you don't have enough oxygen, you don't have enough nutrients, those fatty acids go in, same fatty acids, but the Krebs cycle is altered, you only get two molecules of ATP. So 38 versus two, right? So your, your energy drops, man. It's like your, that's your gasoline, remember? It's your gasoline for your cells so it can do work. It drops, so you're tired. Systems begin to break down. Why? They don't have energy to do anything, to work, okay? Here's what this can look like. This is, again, I just want you to see a big picture. I want you to see how this affects you and it affects everyone, right? So too much sympathetic firing. What did we just say? Chronic fatigue, right? You're not producing enough energy. You're tired. You're tired all the time for no reason, okay? Fibromyalgia. Your B vitamins, your nutrients, all those things are used up. You don't have enough oxygen in your system to break down the lactic acid. You start to get pain all over your body, right? Depression, right? With long-term uh, glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid release, with long-term cortisol elevation, with long-term stress, we see shrinkage in the frontal lobes and the hippocampus. Shrinkage of frontal lobes leads to depression. Depression is a hypofrontality, it's lack of frontal lobe integrity, okay? You get depressed. Hippocampus, okay, that's your memories, leads to dementia, right? We see this with chronic stress, and I actually lecture on, I've lectured on this at least three times now about how the current situation with COVID and all this craziness going on is affecting our frontal lobes, our hippocampus, and all sorts of vagal system implications and whatnot, and it's shrinking our, the parts of our brain. Uh, that are very important, right? So we get depression. Insomnia, why? You have adrenaline coursing, coursing through your body, right? Adrenaline keeps you up. It, let, it, it makes you run away. We all know what it's like to have that adrenaline surge, right? If you have this going on, if you have this chronic stress response, man, you're not going to be able to go to sleep. Diabetes, obesity, why? Because of the blood sugar dysregulation. What do we say? We said that you have elevated uh, cortisol leading to gluconeogenesis, right? You have all this blood sugar floating around. It's gonna lead to blood sugar dysfunction, like diabetes, it's gonna lead to obesity, right? Reflux, ulcers, gallbladder problems. Look, every sphincter in your body is under the control of the parasympathetic nervous system. Every sphincter in your body, the circular muscles that are in your GI tract, right? they're all under the control of the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, so if you have this increase in sympathetic tone, your fight or flight system, it's like a seesaw, right? You don't get both firing at the same time. Increase fight or flight, decrease parasympathetic. That's how it works, right? So if that happens, that sphincter, which is under the control of parasympathetics, right? Up here where your esophagus meets your stomach is one, right? If, if you have your fight or flight system uh, you know, firing too much, you'll lose tone. It'll, it'll, you know, be looser, right? So when you eat your food, 
uh, that food should go through that sphincter, go into your stomach, <clears throat> be digested, and be out of your stomach within an hour or two, right? So what happens with chronic stress, we get decreased transient time out of the stomach. It does not digest our food uh, fast enough, and it's sitting in there. And now we have a weak sphincter right here that's not closing, and now it happens that food, undigested food starts to reflex up. So that's not a problem of too much stomach acid. In fact, that's kind of difficult to have. You can't really have too much stomach acid with a chronic stress response. So says the physiology books, right? So that's kind of weird. So we don't want to take a PPI for, you know, acid reflux necessarily. What do we want to do? We want to work on our stress response. Maybe take a digestive enzyme, get that food out of there faster, right? Um, same thing with ulcers, right? The lower esophageal sphincter, right? Um, which is where um, you know, the, the stomach turns into, you know, the part of the small intestine, it doesn't fully close, right? Because it's, again, it's not able to with a chronic stress response. Stomach acid starts to leak out into the duodenum and you get your duodenal ulcer, right? Gallbladder problems, man, whenever you consume food, especially high fat, you should have a good contraction of the gallbladder to spit out, um, you know, bile into the GI tract to digest your fats. Um, if you don't have good uh, parasympathetic tone controlling that system, it's not going to fully contract. You have undigested food in your gut, but all that, that bile sitting in your gallbladder is going to just sit there. It's not going to have a full contraction to get out. Over time, it turns sludgy. Over time, that turns into gallstones. Okay. Leaky gut, irritable bowel, ulcer of colitis. What did we say earlier? When we have this uh, chronic fight or flight, uh, mechanism going on. Well, what happens? Well, instead of blood flow going into the gut to digest our food, we, you know, our body responds like we're running away from a bear. We have this chronic fight or flight, right? So blood then is shunted from, from our abdomen, from our gut into our uh, arms and legs so we can run away or fight, right? And so what happens? The, the gut lining begins to break down, right? Or the same mechanism as earlier where we have an um, a, a brain that hasn't fully matured, our gut breaks down. This leads to irritable bowel, ulcerative colitis, all these inflammatory bowel issues, right? And then we have all of our autoimmune conditions. Why? Because as the gut breaks down, large proteins start to leak through our gut lining, okay? And now our immune system, we're out of that oral tolerance phase like we talked about earlier as a child, right? Now our immune system's going, hey, I don't really recognize that. Maybe that's a bacteria, maybe it's a virus. I'm gonna start attacking it. And so all these big proteins start to leak through, our immune system starts attacking it. And that stuff starts floating around and it lands in tissue, okay? It lands in skin or the brain or the heart or the thyroid. And then our immune system can start to attack the tissue that it lands in, right? That's called molecular mimicry. So that's the development of all of our autoimmune conditions. We have decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, infertility, because if you're in this chronic, you know, fight or flight state, you're probably not trying to make a baby, right? Thyroid problems because of how it responds to the adrenal or uh, adrenal glands um, for sure, right? So again, just a, a little breakdown of, you know, how this is not just brain injury, although this, you know, we're very focused on brain injury with this lecture, but this, this information, this concept, this developmental functional neurology approach is very applicable to so many different situations. This isn't it. This isn't everything. This is just, you know, something for me to talk through and for you to kind of see like, oh my gosh, like this applies to me too, or this applies to, you know, my other kids or, you know, however, you know, this may apply to your life, right? So there's that. Now, how it applies to me I mean, I work on both my kids, okay? I do. This is Gavin. You saw a picture of Nolan earlier. I've worked on them both. Um, Gavin, um, you know, one time when I was in Dubai, this was uh, several years ago, I was in Dubai. I was consulting um, for a project there for autism and neurobehavioral disorders. And I get a phone call from my wife. Um, you know, she's very frantic. Um, and she said that Gavin actually fell backwards uh, and hit his head. Um, he was sitting on a wall. He fell back. I think he was like five or six foot tall. Um, he was very lethargic. And then he was kind of coming, you know, in and out of consciousness. Uh, rushed him to, the, you know, I told her, okay, stop everything. Go to the ER. They went to the ER. Uh, finally got imaging of his brain. Uh, by then, you know, he, he did get to the point where it was kind of hard to wake him up. Um, but, you know, so he had this brain injury. Now, fortunately, 
my wife had lasers at home. She started therapy before I even got home, right? But talk about a terrible feeling being halfway around the world and having your youngest child, you know, in the ER un, uh, you know, unresponsive at the time. So it's terrible. So he has this left brain weakness tendency, right? Now, we fully rehabbed him from that situation. He was good to go. But what happened um, here recently, right? is he now i check all my kids i check my kids every month to see if they have you know primitive reflexes to see if they have any of these developmental asynchronies or developmental delays right so i'm checking their uh their muscle tone i'm checking their primitive reflexes their hemispheric balances all the things that we talked about right i'm checking them okay what i noticed is that through covid um gavin started to change a little bit and he started to become a lot more fearful um, he started having bad dreams and it got to the point to where he wouldn't even stay in the same room uh, by himself. He was so fearful. And he didn't know what he was scared of. He was just scared, right? That's a fear paralysis reflex, right? That's a permanent reflex called a fear paralysis reflex. Highly implicated with the vagal system. Uh, the Moreau, the startle reflex actually inhibits the fear paralysis reflex. Uh, and we see this a lot with a right brain weakness, or I'm sorry, a left brain weakness, right? Which is what Gavin tends to have. Um, and so I, I checked him and he had several primitive reflexes that had come back out, right? And so the, the emotional mental stress of COVID and everyone staying home and no school and all this kind of stuff, it impacted him. And that was, that acted like a trigger for him. And so you saw the brain lose some integration, right? So I haven't brought my own child in for a week long intensive uh, because, you know, th this is what I do. I believe in this stuff wholeheartedly, you know, I walk, with, you know, I practice what I preach for sure. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there so you know that I'm for real. And, uh, you know, I truly, truly do believe in this stuff. So, um, so that's what I got for you. I hope you understand this, right? I hope that that wasn't too much information. But, you know, just again, to kind of summarize, um, the brain has a blueprint for development. It develops from the bottom up right? It develops from the bottom up, from the left to the right. I'm sorry, from the bottom up, from the right to the left. And then as we develop our hemispheres, as we develop our frontal lobes, it then begins to come down in what we call a top-down regulation, right? It starts to inhibit those brainstem reflexes, okay? So that's the neurodevelopmental blueprint for brain development. Very important wide red you know wide broad reaching implications and and how you can apply this stuff to your life and to the life of others so hope you enjoyed it i know i did um so yeah thank you for attending and i appreciate you thanks